Hello and welcome to Rugby and District Astronomical Society's Sky Notes for the period from the 18th of August to the 15th of September 2013. The first thing to mention is that we had a very good session observing the Persids on the 12th of August and here we are setting up in the field and Dave Riley took notes of the meteors he saw during the evening and he broke them down into one hour time slots calculating the zenith hourly rate for the meteors which went from 47 from the period from 2200 to 2300 to 120 from the period from 0200 to 0300 on the mo early morning of the 13th. So we'll start off looking at the sky in September. The image here shows how the sky will look at 0100 on the 1st, midnight on the 15th and 2300 on the 30th of September. The summer triangle is still fairly well overhead as are the summer constellations but the autumn constellations are starting to make their appearance. We have Pegasus fairly high in the south along with Andromeda and Pisces. Also the stars Capella and Aldebaran are on the rise. The Milky Way still arcs overhead from the northeast to the southwest and could be found because the constellations of both Cygnus and Cassiopeia, two easily distinguishable constellations, lie within the Milky Way. The phases of the moon this month are a new moon on the 5th, first quarter on the 12th, full moon on the 19th and last quarter on the 27th of September. On the morning of the 2nd of September, Mars is in conjunction with the Moon and this is the view over the eastern horizon. Jupiter is also visible higher up. From the 8th to the 10th of September, Mars is in conjunction with the Beehive Cluster M44 in Cancer. Only half a degree separates Mars from the centre of the cluster and you'll also notice that Comet C2012S1 Ison is in the vicinity, but this is Mag 15, so you're going to need a large telescope to see it and even then you'd probably be better off trying to capture it photographically as you're unlikely to see it visually. If you're looking for M44, if you find the bright stars Pollux and Procyon and look for Jupiter and you should be able to find out where Mars is and that's where the cluster will be in the background. This diagram shows the path of both Mars and Ison over the period from the 8th to the 10th and both are moving towards the east. In a study undertaken in February of this year, nearly 1900 observations were used to create a light curve of the comet. The comet was increasing its brightness relatively quickly and if this had continued to perihelion it would have reached magnitude minus 17 which is far brighter than the full moon. However, as is usual with many Oort cloud comets, it exhibited what's known as a slowdown event. So we can expect Ison's brightness to increase less quickly than predicted and it won't be as bright as expected, although it should still give a good performance. Recent observations suggest that if it remains intact it will brighten to, at best, a magnitude of about minus 6, which is still very bright and will outshine all the planets. It's also been determined that Ison is a baby comet, which is a, an object which is less than 4 comet years old, a comet year being the time it takes to orbit the Sun. There is a problem that the comet will approach within the Sun's Roche limit, which is where the gravitational effect of the Sun can cause bodies approaching to break up due to gravitational tidal forces. This, in conjunction with the expected heating of the comet to around 2700 degrees C, may cause it to disintegrate before it comes out from perihelion, its closest approach to the Sun, where we won't be able to see the comet. We have a recent observation taken in April by the Hubble Space Telescope and you can see the comet here with the scale of 15,000 miles and you'll see that its head points towards the Sun and the tail will always point away from the Sun. Comets tails are usually brighter when they're heading away from the Sun and they actually precede the comet because the dust and gas are being blown off by the pressure of the solar wind so it will always head directly away from the Sun. September's constellation of the month is Pegasus. In Greek mythology, Pegasus is a white-winged horse that sprang from the neck of the Gorgon Medusa when Perseus beheaded her. And this is an image from the 1981 film Clash of the Titans, animated by the late Ray Harryhausen. The other famous myth involving Pegasus is the one of Bellephoron. 
He was a hero sent by King Iobates of Lycia to kill the Chimera, a monster that breathed fire and was devastating the king's land. Bellephorin found Pegasus and tamed him using a golden bridle given to him by the goddess Athena. He then swooped down on the Chimera and killed the monster with his lance and arrows. After several other heroic deeds for King Iobates, Bellephorin let the success go to the heads and riding Pegasus he tried to fly to Olympus and join the gods. Like Icarus, he didn't succeed and he fell off the horse and back to earth to his death. Pegasus did make it to Olympus and Zeus used the horse to carry his thunder and lightning and eventually placed him among the constellations. The constellation of Pegasus is depicted in artwork with only the top half of the horse and the wings. Nevertheless, it is one of the largest constellations in the sky, seventh in size by area. This area of the sky features several other characters involved with the myth of Pegasus. We have Perseus here with the slain head of the Gorgon Medusa, and here we have Andromeda, whom Perseus saved after he had tamed Pegasus. Also, Cassiopeia, Cephas and Cetus feature in this area of the sky. Pegasus is quite faint and spread out, so there aren't a lot of stars that you can see close together, although the Great Square of Pegasus is a well-known asterism. If you can find Cassiopeia, you can use two of the stars to point the way to Pegasus. And if you can't find Cassiopeia, but you can find the plough, you can use the pointers of the plough to find the North Star. And right hand down a bit, you will find the W-shaped group of stars, which is the main part of Cassiopeia. The Great Square of Pegasus is an asterism, meaning it's a group of stars that doesn't form a, a constellation. This asterism is one that is made up of more than one constellation, three of the stars being in Pegasus and the fourth one being in Andromeda. Looking at the three stars of Pegasus in the square of Pegasus, Alpha, Alpha is a giant blue star with an apparent visual magnitude of 2.48 and lies approximately 133 light years distance. Although it's known as Alpha, it is only the third brightest star in Pegasus and is around about five times the size of the Sun. Beta is the second brightest star in the constellation. It's a red star halfway between subgiant and giant stage. The star lies around about 196 light years away and is classified as a semi regular variable star with a period of 43 and a third days. Its magnitude doesn't change much from 2.31 to 2.74, so you'd probably need to compare photographic images to see the difference in brightness. Gamma is a blue subgiant star with a magnitude of 2.84 and lies approximately 390 light years distant. Its brightness varies from magnitude 2.78 to 2.89. Its mass is around about nine times that of the Sun and its diameter about five times that of the Sun. It's also 5,840 times more luminous than our Sun. Epsilon is the, actually the brightest star in Pegasus, lies approximately 690 light years away from the Sun and is an orange supergiant. It's 12 times more massive than the Sun and about 5,000 times more luminous and is 185 times the Sun's diameter. It's an LC type slow irregular variable and has a greater range than either beta or gamma in that it varies from 0.7 to 3.5 in magnitude. 51 Pegasi is a main sequence star similar to the Sun, lies about 51 light years away. With an apparent magnitude of 5.49, it means you'll need very dark skies to see it. This star is noted. In that it's the first star similar to the Sun that had a planet discovered in its orbit. The exoplanet 51 Pegasi b was discovered on October the 6th 1995 and is around about half the mass of Jupiter. The planet was given the unofficial nickname Belepharon. Uh, finally for the stars in Pegasus we have IK Pegasi. It's a binary star approximately 150 light years distant. Its visual magnitude is again quite low, it's just over 6, and the two stars in the system have an orbital period of 21.7 days. The brighter component is a main sequence white star, and the companion is a white dwarf. As the larger star goes through its evolution and turns into a red giant, the smaller star will begin to accrete matter from it. 
in the end it will increase in mass and it will erupt into a type 1a supernova. Looking at deep sky objects, the most famous one in the constellation is Messier 15 NGC 7078. It is a globular cluster about 18 arc minutes in size and it has an apparent visual magnitude of 6.2 and lies around about 33,500 light years distant. The brightest stars in the cluster are of magnitude 12.6. The cluster was discovered by Italian born astronomer Jean Dominique Moraldi in 1746 and was included in Messier's catalogue in 1764. It is believed to be about 12 billion years old, which makes it one of the oldest globular clusters known, and contains more than 100,000 stars. Among them are a significant number of variables and pulsars, including the double neutron star M15C. The cluster is also home to Pease 1, a planetary nebula discovered in 1928. Pease 1 was the first planetary nebula discovered within a globular cluster. We have two further images of M15. This one is taken with a 4 inch telescope and a single exposure on a DSLR and represents how the cluster appears in telescopes today. This second one was taken with a 6 inch telescope and a CCD system which brings out more of the detail. Also in Pegasus we have the galaxy NGC 7331 also known as Coldwell 30. It's a visual magnitude of 10.4 and is about 4 million light years distant. The galaxy was discovered by the German born British astronomer William Herschel in 1784. It's a similar size and structure to the Milky Way and is the brightest galaxy in the NGC 7331 group, which is also known as the Dear Lick group. The notable thing about this galaxy is that its bulge is rotating in the opposite direction to the rest of the galaxy's disk which may indicate that it's actually been formed by the collision of two other galaxies. Lying close but far fainter than NGC 7331 is Stefan's Quintet, HGC 92 or ARP 319. The group of five galaxies are numbered from NGC 7317 to 7320. Four of the galaxies lie about 280 million light years from Earth and they were the first compact group of galaxies ever discovered. The brightest galaxy is NGC 7320 which is actually in front of the other galaxies and only lies about 40 million light years distant. The other four galaxies form a close physical association and the HGC number stands for Hickson Compact Group and these galaxies will all eventually merge. Finally, laying near the great square of Pegasus, we have the Andromeda galaxy M31. It is quite easy to star hop to the galaxy from the top left hand star in the great square of Pegasus, which is actually in Andromeda. So if you follow the steps here, leapfrogging from star to star, you will eventually find yourself at the galaxy. We're going to move on to some members images now. Some of these were taken at the Perseid Observing Session on the 12th of August. Here we have the first of the two ISS passes of the evening, as it the ISS passes by Vega and it was taken by Sarah Meek. Towards the end of the evening we had a magnitude minus 6.8 iridium flare captured here. Here we have Pete Larkin's wide field view of the Milky Way clearly showing the dust bands and the clouds of stars. And here we have Mark Edwards from Coventry and Warwickshire Astronomical Society's photo of one of the Persid meteors near Cassiopeia, clearly showing its greenish colour. And finally we have the Hart Nebula IC1805 or SH2-190 lies about 7,500 light years away in the constellation of Cassiopeia and it's an emission nebula showing glowing gas and darker dust lines. This image is one of the ones taken by Chris Longthorne with his CCD system. And finally it just remains for me to thank all of our contributors and for Chris Longthorne for writing the script for Sky Notes and we'll see you all next month for the next edition.